morning, Uganda. Good morning, Ugandans. Uh, those who are already paying taxes and those who are hopeful to join the League of Tax Paying Ugandans, we bring you greetings from uh, the URA TV studio. And uh, of course, this morning, we are going to be having this rather simple but uh, difficult conversation on uh, VAT fraud schemes existing in Uganda. Uh, my name is Solomon Chimugwe, your host for today. And uh, of course, I'm joined in studio by our chief investigator, the Commissioner Tax Investigation Department, Mr. Dennis Kugonza, who will come in the picture very quickly. And of course, uh, we also have with us the chief custodian of all professional accountants that are chartered in Uganda, uh, Mr. Derek Nkaja. At this very moment, I'm going to uh, give them an opportunity to say hello to you, after which we shall quickly dig deep into the discussion for today. I'll start with uh, Mr. Dennis Kugonza. Uh, good morning, our good taxpayers, our good clients uh, of URA who pay taxes for national development. We are here to discuss with you and have a discussion and a conversation on how we can develop our country through payment of taxes. Welcome to this show. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, over to you, Derek. Uh, thank you, Solomon. Good morning, Uganda. Good morning, taxpayers. Good morning, staff of URA, especially our members, the full members, associate members, and students of the accountancy profession. Good morning. I hope you are doing what it takes to be good professional accountants and collecting taxes on behalf of Ugandans. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Derek. The stage is set, and I must say that uh, the convers conversation can uh, effectively begin. Uh, and first things first, a person is uh, on the other side of the screen, and they are wondering exactly what it is that we are here to, to talk about. Because when you say that fraud for a taxman and an accountant, those words are very clear but there is that ordinary Ugandan who's tuned in and they want to know and they're probably interacting with this set of two English words for the very first time and they want to understand when we say that fraud exactly what do we mean Dennis uh, thank you Solomon uh, what fraud it is what fraud is any criminal deception connected to that intended for financial gain of a taxpayer it is a wrongful and criminal deception by taxpayer intent to give personal or financial gain. Therefore, if a taxpayer knowingly or recklessly does something that causes financial loss uh, to government, then he commits fraud. In that shared, it's an offense for a taxpayer to report and pay less tax than he ought to have done. Solomon, that's the legality, but yes. business-wise, we say it's the business dishonesty. That's fraud, basically simple. For those who don't know the, the legalese of uh, the investigator. Fraud. <laughs> but fraud. Um, I, I like the simplistic angle so that everyone gets to know exactly uh, what this means. Uh, even that person who is not necessarily technical. But uh, sticking to VAT, because fortunately or oh, unfortunately, VAT is a bit technical. Um, if you can describe for me exactly the kind of profile of an individual who fits into this bracket of uh, vote fraud, like the person, the person who is said to, to be involved in that fraud, you're said to, to have been involved in that fraud when uh, what specific situations are realistic to you? Uh, but that is a, a tax which is paid by the final consumer. So the people in business, the businesses, their duty is to collect on behalf of government. They are agents. You, when you sell, you charge output VAT. Yes. You charge VAT. And when you buy, you get input VAT. So you get the in output minus the input you have paid out, and then the net is paid to URA. So if any businessman doesn't declare all that in out, uh, that net liability, to a net tax, which he has collected on behalf of government, he is involved in bad fraud. 
One of the ways is they don't to declare all the sales introduces the total output of VAT. Or they inflate or they forge invoices to increase their input VAT. So it reduces the net payment to URA, and that is called VAT fraud. Interesting. So um, the moment someone projects a picture that is unfairly beneficial to themselves as a taxpayer in terms of input and output VAT, then that person is uh, considered to have been involved in VAT fraud. Um, we, we, we cannot speak about VAT, VAT fraud without uh, making it very clear uh, to the side of the taxpayer on who is supposed to be registered for VAT, because I don't think it's anyone's game. No. Who uh, qualifies? The VAT, they qualify people. If you have income, sales of 150 million a year, 150 million and above in a year, you qualify to be on VAT register. But even below that, you can voluntarily register for VAT. Voluntary yes. registration for VAT. I'm there, I'm a businessman, and I'm, of course, dealing in VAT items, and I want to register for VAT on my own accord. Uh, what are some of the things that I must take care of if I'm to be a voluntarily registered VAT taxpayer in Uganda? Uh, you have to be registered with the ATIN, the Ugandan taxpayer. Uh, you must, the URA, you apply to URA. They have a form. Then you come and inspect your premises so that you have a proper business office, uh, a board, and then they can be able to deal with you. It is as simple as that. You have a team, you have a registered business, you have a shop or a place where you can be found or where the business is located. There's physical location. Then you qualify to be on VAT register. Then uh, the person who... And you are dealing in vertebral items. items. Absolutely. Then you've also talked about the scenario for compulsory registration, where someone is not necessarily willing to get registered for VAT, but uh, they've been able to fulfill some uh, elements as they are going about their business that require them to be registered for VAT, and URA comes in. So what are these uh, particular circumstances that would require someone to, to be obliged to register for VAT. Yes, if you are dealing or selling goods or a service, which is not VAT exempt, it is VATable, and you have income of more than, you have sales of more than 150 million a year, you are supposed to register for VAT. And if you don't register, that is considered also VAT fraud. <clears throat> uh, or you have 37.5 37, 37 million per three months, per quarter. Also, you qualify for VAT registration. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis, for that submission. For the interest of uh, someone who has just joined the show, uh, this particular revenue pulse is, uh, of course, powered by you, the taxpayer. But uh, on air in studio today, we've been joined by uh, the Commissioner, Tax Investigations Department, Uganda Revenue Authority, and uh, the head, the executive officer, chief executive officer of uh, the Institute of Chartered uh, Public Accountants of Uganda. All of the professional accountants are under this body. And uh, I'm going to ask this particular question uh, to directly to Mr. Derek uh, Nkaja, CPA. Uh, it's a question that is coming from a position of concern because in the recent past, uh, about an average of 15, fraudsters have been nabbed, some related to VAT crimes, others related to some other crimes. But of these, uh, a good number of them have been purporting to be accountants. Um, is this an issue of concern to you as the leader of uh, that institution? Uh, uh, thank you, Solomon. It's good you, you have used the word purporting. It's a very big concern right from the start of uh, setting up uh, the institute. Uh, Uganda as a country, we had a very disintegrated accountancy profession. We could even say that there was no profession 
until 1992, 1994, 1997. Those are the uh, formative years of uh, the accountancy profession in Uganda. The training was hard and many or majority have continued to think that uh, everyone can be an accountant. So anyone who learns something about accountancy uh, wants to be an accountant. It's like anyone trying to learn something about law and says I'm a lawyer or something about biology and say I'm a doctor. We still have that challenge as a country. It's a simple profession that can easily be joined by anyone, even if you started there from a different angle. And uh, we encourage everyone to join. But specifically back to the question, are the accountants the problem? I don't think so. They are actually part of the solution. Uh, VAT, as described by the chief investigator here, is a tax that is actually collected with records. Because if you don't record, then likely to have VAT fraud. And when you record improperly, then you are also having a VAT a fraud. So I would say that it is not really professional accountants. I have not come across a case of professional accountants in VAT fraud, mm. but I've come across, uh, I have had so many uh, fraudsters calling themselves accountants. And that's the challenge the public has, identifying who is an accountant, who is not an accountant. Our portal, uh, the website, icpau.co.ug, uh, is very much available to verify whoever calls himself as an accountant. It's public information, and I invite the public always to cross-check. If they can't check the web portal, they can reach our offices and walk in. And true, there are those who have actually asked, especially those recruiting or those who are taking on an auditor. And they have course checked and they have found that the people they have been trying to use are not accountants. So it's, it's a challenge and it needs consulted effort by all of us to understand that our country will only develop when we professionalize. Uh, as, the, as the, His Excellency was professionalizing the army, a number of the sectors were never professionalized. And some of them even have good framework for professionalization, but which is not being emphasized by the various players in the market. So that's our call as professional accountants. Let everyone be uh, understanding that there's a profession called accountancy and people who play within that profession are regulated and you can get good professional accountants, Ugandan, excellent, skilled, and they can help you to do your tax affairs. Uh, thank you so much, Derek, for really clarifying uh, the picture there because uh, the people who are starting to misperceive, you know, with report after report coming out. And uh, of course, you've taken us through the formative years of the profession, and it's clearly been a journey. Where we are today is not where we were so many years ago, and we can only improve from here on. Um, with that, though, and you've also talked about the portal that someone can visit and uh, verify whether someone is actually a certified accountant or someone is just showing face. But beyond all of that, because there are also these elements that people should be able to utilize without necessarily tapping into, I'm a believer, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I believe in uh, uh, the spirit of discernment. But in those moments where someone does not have the, the spirit of discernment and they're not able to, you know, instinctively tell that I'm probably not dealing with a professional accountant here. What are those qualities that people should be able to look at and as they're interacting with this individual they're taking off or making crosses in terms of giving this person the responsibility of dealing on their behalf? from an accountancy perspective? Okay, uh, uh, th that's a very nice angle because we all need to have some spirit of discernment, every believer and every uh, good citizen because I don't think the, there's a citizen who is not discerning, even the wrong ones discern in their or wrong way. But with the spirit of discernment, you look at how the accountant starts his work mm. because the accountants are supposed to be professional, ethical, skilled in what they are doing, 
And uh, for me, those are the basics. So if you find an accountant, he hasn't started uh, on the work, but he's not asking the nature of the work, but he's asking for money first. Um, that accountant, I suppose, is likely to be wrong because he's looking at getting the little money you pay and he runs away. A true professional accountant will start by understanding the extent of work because he needs to know how he's going to bill you based on the volume of work you're giving and the time it will take to execute your work. Then if you find an accountant who cannot give you a report, uh, basically a report um, not copied and pasted, because I have seen reports, uh, it's in the transport sector and someone is quoting things of agriculture. That means that that accountant is not an accountant. He copied somewhere in, from agriculture and pasted it in transport. Word for word. Word for word. So you just get to know this is a scammer, he's not an accountant. If you find someone who speaks a lot and talks about uh, how he knows the accountants of the country, that one is also likely to be, he's trying to show you that he knows the accountants. Uh, accountants don't show off. A majority I have come across, uh, don't show off. I don't think uh, the chief investigator has ever been there say, I'm the chief investigator, no. The accountants, who move with their works. It's their works that uh, advertise for them. It's their works that determine who they are. So if you find a show of person trying to say I'm an accountant, most likely he's not um, because um, he, he, he's trying, trying to, to massage people's ego so that they don't ask other questions. So that will be for me the basics of discerning who an accountant. I, I, I particularly liked the very last one uh, about them not showing off. Uh, it's a fact. They're usually soft-spoken. They're more about the numbers. But uh, once in a while, and I think they probably do this for quick identification, they have CPA on, <laughs> on, on their Twitter handles and their LinkedIn profiles, <laughs> even here uh, at, at URA because we, we have a very, very huge amount of them. And uh, on their emails, you, you see a byline there. Someone is clearly identifying themselves, CPA, SCCA, and you know, all those things. We, I, I think it, it, it's, it's a bit of a balance. It's an honor. People if, need if, to know if, if who you, you have, are. If you have graduated as a doctor, would you say I'm not a doctor? So for them to use their CPA, it's an honor and the law allows it because they want to show and separate from those fraudsters that for me, I, I went through the formalities. I am trained, I'm ethical. I can give you the right service. And in our code, if you are unable to deliver the service, you call your fellow accountant who is able and knowledgeable in that skill to take on your client. We don't fight with clients. And that's why I'm saying every client, every taxpayer, who is challenged by an accountant they have, and that accountant is not referring you to the next best accountant. That accountant is a fraud. You dealing with the fraud. I like that. I'll, I'll get back to you on the issue of the code because it's uh, a conversation that uh, I would like us to dig a little deeper into. But uh, just to get back to the chief investigator on uh, the issue of VAT fraud, which is the main discussion, um, paint for us a picture of uh, the offenses. I know it's a cocktail. There are quite a number of them. The offenses related to VAT fraud. Let's paint a very clear picture for the benefit of the person who is on the other side of the camera so that they get to know even some of the things that they were probably thinking, this is OK. Let them get to fully appreciate the full extent of uh, uh, what VAT fraud is so that they're able to keep away from you know, all these elements. Yeah. Thank you, Solomon. There are different forms of VAT fraud. One is underreporting of sales. So if reduced sales, then it means that VAT which was paid is not fully being reported. Failure is, the sixth one is about failure to register for VAT. You are within the bracket in threshold of 150 million sales per year, but you are not registering. It means you are also not uh, just a form of VAT fraud. Mm. Then there is a misclassification of, of, of items, of commodities you are selling. The, 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 the good is standard rated, but you are showing it as exempt. 
that also VAT fraud. Then when you collect VAT and you don't remit, you don't pay it to RA within time, that is also VAT fraud. And then if you manipulate the systems, you have put up systems like EFRIS, and it is being manipulated, you are not connected to RA system, that is also one form of VAT fraud. And also invoice trading, where you find you are buying invoices, which are not, where there was no sale or there was no transaction, that is also <clears throat> VAT fraud. And many other, all those forms, you have offenses in the law, VAT of law. Mm. There is fair financial tax return under section 54 of Tax Procedure Code Act 2014. There's failure to maintain proper records, section 56. There's making false or misleading statements, section 58. There's aiding or abating a tax offense, that is section 60. Then there are offenses relating to registration, that is section 62. Uh, there's an offense to make use of false documents. There's forgery of official documents. There's obtaining money by false pretense and uttering false documents. Those all are offenses and they have penalties, ranging from fines, uh, penalties, and sentencing. Sentencing starts from two years to 10 years, depending on the volume and the gravity of the case. Wow. Where there is an offense, there is <laughs> a stick. Yes. <laughs> or oh, should we call it either a penalty or you know something else? You're supposed to uh, do the right thing, failure to do the right thing. You you find yourself in a situation where you're in, interacting with the law, but in uh, very unfavorable terms. And our duty as tax investigators is to deliver you to the law. You, you so could say that again. <laughs> our duty as tax investigators is to identify you and deliver you to justice. Interesting. Um, I, I want to first keep the conversation right here on, on the penalties because people are tuned in and they are wondering what penalty goes for what offense. If we can have uh, a, a quick run, run through them so that they, they appreciate this. You talked about the penalty of failure to apply for registration or failure to cancel registration, or failure to notify the commissioner of a change in registration yes. of your VAT circumstance. What penalty is in line with that? A uh, failure to furnish return in section 54, there is a fine not exceeding 25 currency points on conviction. And each currency point is 20,000 shillings. A uh, failure to maintain proper records, there is a fine not exceeding 48 currency points, or to imprisonment, not exceeding two years, or both on conviction. Two years for not keeping proper records. Yes. Or both with even a fine of currency points, which is means you even pay. The law is that clear. Very clear. Um, what about a scenario where um someone has knowingly or unknowingly failed to pay? tax and, and i'm saying this mm. these words are quite considerately because it's very difficult to knowingly forget <laughs> but where someone fails to pay the tax before or before the due date you basically see the due date come and go by and you've not been able to you know file or pay this vat that you're supposed to what happens to you uh, if you don't there is a penalty of uh, 200 of 200,000 for failure to pay per day. And then there is also the double, the penalty of double the tax you had not remitted. Double the tax. The tax. There also, there's also interest, 2% per month of unpaid tax. You have paid properly, you have made a return, but you have not paid. So it means you are using government money as a loan. So we shall charge you 2% tax. 2% interest for that loan for that loan the interesting things are happening here um of course the taxpayer has some obligations and maybe if you could spend some time making these obligations very clear to the taxpayer uh that concern vat 
then they'll have no excuses mm -hmm. in, in the next maybe one or two minutes if you can break down mm -hmm. the obligations of a VAT registered taxpayer, the things that they should take to heart and they start practicing. And what are these elements? The obligation is, is to keep proper records first. You have to have a proper record and supported by a proper invoice of sale and purchase. Uh, the taxpayer is supposed to file a return by the due date. The due date is the 15th of the preceding month. Of the following month, uh, that is by. After that, then we shall charge a penalty and also charge interest. Uh, the taxpayer has the right to fair treatment by URA. He has the right to know the, how much he's supposed to get and is to pay and how much the right to privacy of his records. But mainly, you have a right and it's an obligation to make sure the return, if a, right, a correct return is submitted to URA in the right format prescribed by URA in the law and paid by the due date. All these things have to be done to avoid finding yourself in the other situation. The other situation where, where you're being delivered. Non-compliant. And if you are bordering, when you are non-compliant, then we shall find you. But if you are, they are involved in fraud in one of the areas I mentioned, then they will shall identify you and deliver you to face justice. As clear as night and day. Um, I, I return to you, Derek, where we left off. Yes. <clears throat> uh, we were talking about the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Any professional entity, any profession is guided by a pillar, or should we call it canons, that guide the way that they go about business. In the case of uh, the accountants in Uganda, the question I'm going to ask is a two in one. Uh, the first side of it is paint for us a picture. If you can single out some of these major canons that uh, guide the way accountants go about business. You hinted on one earlier. Then the second part of the question is uh, the, the issue of the fit. What is the fit of, uh, should we unfortunately find ourselves in a situation where an actual professional accountant has been uh, found wanting? They lost, they lost the, the spirit of discernment <laughs> and God forbid they've been involved in, a, uh, you know, that fraud and they're, they're here facing mm. uh, the chief investigator and, and the law. What is the fate of such an accountant from the perspective of the profession? Okay, uh, thank you, Solomon. <clears throat> but to reach that fate, I'd like the public to know that um, our professional uh, act, the Accountants Act, requires a person to complain. Mm. And my appeal to the public is always complain. Complain about the accountants as much as possible. And the complaint is not a complaint unless it is registered at the institute. So that would be the starting point before even the investigator comes. Mm. Because so many cases we have seen that um, there, is a there is a misunderstanding between the accountant and the business person uh or the say the accountant and his client and which can be resolved professionally uh, the person can actually be brought to explain uh even before you reach the criminal side which the investigator handles <clears throat> so we want the public to complain as much as possible about an accountant because that also helps them to identify who is a true accountant that's the first side i'll start off with the second would be as you you asked uh, if everything fails and then something happens, what do we do? We have a very robust disciplinary uh, process. That's why I said we must have a complainant. It has the first instance, uh, which is the disciplinary committee, then the appeal, which is the disciplinary appeals committee. And if you fail in the disciplinary appeals committee, you go to the high court. So it doesn't stop there. The process of adjudication is very clear and you can take on an accountant uh, in any form provided what you're talking about is very clear the challenge that comes up in our business transactions is that many people do not write the the business transaction so you count a disciplinary mechanism and the accountant is describing what he understood to be done and the the, the 
the contractor or the business person is also describing something different that needed to be done. So there you are at a loss. Where do you go? Who is wrong? Who is right? But if the public can write, as the chief investigator said, that records, records, records. VAT fraud is mainly uh, because records are not proper. Even a record of engaging an accountant should be proper. That's when we shall know who is at wrong. So when that happens, we take you through the disciplinary process. We, you, you give your side of, of, of explanation. The complainant gives also the side of it. And then the professionals on that committee determine whether you are wrong or whether you are right. And if a person is not satisfied, either an accountant or the complainant, you move to the appeals uh, committee. And once an appeals committee is chaired by, uh, uh, by an advocate, so you can't say that it's an accountant deciding your case. Um, if the appeals committee also sees that you are guilty, you move on uh, with the penalties that are sanctioned. Our highest sanction is being deregistered. And we have deregistered accountants um, uh, along the, the, the way, about four accountants. So we deregister people and they get off. Then you know that for the remainder of your useful life, you are not an accountant. Nobody should download you as an accountant uh, because of uh, the issues uh, in which you conducted yourselves and you found yourself being registered. Um, but we also admonish, we penalize, we make accountants refund money if actually uh, the issue was about refund, uh, you pay for the costs. We have made accountants redo the work at uh, their own cost. Uh, if it, it means that uh, you didn't do what you are supposed to do, uh, you have to redo it, but at your own cost. Um, so th there is there are a range of, of uh, penalties uh, once it is determined that an accountant is at fault. Uh, before we go to the criminal, if it's criminal, we refer you to police because in our setup, we don't handle criminal matters. We handle professional matters. You, you hand them to Dennis. <laughs> yes, then we'll hand the over to, to the teacher. investigator who will deliver him to the justice. <laughs> to the justice, yes. I, I, I really like the clarity that uh, you've given the taxpayers because most of them probably didn't have this kind of insight. That before we even get into the issue of uh, the criminal elements, there's also this issue of, of standards. You've been very clear on the standards. There are some key expectations. And what has been happening is that some accountants have been probably getting away with doing the bare minimum for, probably. for the taxpayers. Yes, it could happen. But now they know that if someone gives you a report and surely you're not really satisfied with it, and you have a place where you can go yes. and, and you have this person go through the process. The process. Um, we shall probably be coming back to you on, on, on that issue. It was a two-in-one. You've talked about this other side, but you've not uh, dived into the basic code of oh. conduct. Uh, so, sorry. That I, uh, even I, as these taxpayers are dealing with the accountants, they have this other checklist. We talked about a checklist before. Yes. Now there are these elements that they need to be looking out for as they're dealing with the account. The, the code is very lengthy. We have a, a very big book. Uh, we call it our Bible of Conduct. Um, it's internationally mapped, mm. um, but we try to re downsize it for Uganda to make sure that we have uh, something that is easy for people to look at. And that conduct, it has at least four bare minimum that I want everyone to, to, to get to know. Please. Um, we we still use the word professionalism, that an accountant must show professionalism. Now, in that professionalism, you must it encompasses quite a number of things. Uh, the way you conduct yourself, um, the way you approach work, uh, the way you document, uh, the, the way you advise. So there is an angle that gives us an, a picture what professionalism of an accountant uh, looks like. And that's very, very important for us to. Then there is 
uh, due care, an accountant works in public interest. So due care is one of those things that we must always ensure that you, you do in your day-to-day -day activities. You are not there just for the, uh, the reward or the gain that you're going to get from an assignment, but due care. Um, because for instance, we have in part of the code, one, the, we have a standard which is about non-compliance of rules, laws and regulations. If you come across as an accountant, you're supposed to report. It doesn't matter whether I have been hired by you, but I find you non-complying, I should report the relevant uh, authority or to the next line of, 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 of the overseer. If, if it's an employee, you report to the manager. If it's a manager, you report to the board where there is non-compliance. Mm -hmm. If it finds the entire company, then you report to probably the regulator of that company and you, you identify the non-compliance. So that's a quality of uh, professionalism, which is within the code. Mm -hmm. And so someone may skip it when we say due care, but that due care is because of our public interest nature, you are not only looking at what your client has asked you to do, but what is the framework you go beyond of reporting that this entity, this client was supposed to, to be playing in and has he or she fulfilled what is supposed to be done. Then you also have um, uh, the, the, the code of, uh, I talked about um, uh, skill, uh, uh, Professionalism, professionalism uh, due care. Due care. Um, uh, then you have to be skilled, uh, although it runs also in professionalism. Um, then we, we, we also have the code of um, being realistic. Uh, because you cannot take on what you cannot, what realistically can't happen. Uh, that means you are not really a professional accountant you must make sure that you go be, you evaluate the environment and see how realistic the activities are. And then you must try to. Now, um, giving to the public, for me, the public, I would like them to understand those three basics on the professional code of conduct of an accountant. Because for the accountant, it goes far beyond because we even have a code of conduct on the assignment itself. Once you start the assignment, how would you have conducted yourself? What would you have taken care of? Uh, which the, 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 the public may not be interested in. But uh, we look at professionalism, due care, and, and uh, uh, proficiency, which is skill. Some books use proficiency, but others use skill. Um, and then realistic. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Uh, the four have been clearly spelled out and you've uh, taken length to really explain what each one of them is about. But just for emphasis, if I, if I can, uh, the accountants should be able to demonstrate professionalism full time, not part time. Not part time. Not on Sunday. All the time. All the time. All the time. Once you're an accountant, you're an accountant for life. You leave accountancy up to the time you leave the earth. Then the second one you talked about is due care. And uh, of course, now this is 360. You're doing the service, but you're also performing the role of the watchdog. Yes. Ensuring that uh, the integrity of the profession is upheld. Indeed. By everyone involved at all times. All times. The other one is uh, skill. This is as clear as night and day. <laughs> you can't perform if you're not skilled. Yes. Then uh, the last one is something that I've really liked. Realistic. You should be able to chew on what you can actually chew. Yes. Chew. You, you, you don't have you don't to bite what you can. Bite an elephant. Yes. When you can handle a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. think that's that's powerful uh, coming from you. Then, of course, I have just a few more questions that we are going to to run through, uh, as we appreciate now the really difficult side because everything in life has consequences. And I'm going back to our chief investigator, and uh, the question that uh, I'm suddenly going to field him is a question that uh, concerns a two in one. 
In fact, this is the only part of the show where we are going to talk about a carrot. There is certainly a benefit to a taxpayer that comes with registering for VAT. That is the carrot that we are dangling in this particular episode. And uh, if you can take the, the viewers through what these benefits are and why it is important for them to get registered for VAT as business people. Yeah, as business taxpayers or business people as a business, it's good to, you have benefits when you register for VAT. One, our companies want to recover their money you are dealing with, when you are doing business. So they will deal with you knowing that VAT paid, they will recover it through input VAT mm. and you'll get business. We have seen where maybe says don't, 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 they don't take on clients because they're not VAT registered. Because you'll be losing that VAT, it means it is a cost to the business. But if it is, is registered, you are dealing with a VAT registered taxpayer, then it means you recover your money and to not eat into your profits. The business will be comfortably be uh, operating everything. Uh, <clears throat> two, you are contributing to the national development as a taxpayer. Whatever services we are getting in this country, all the social services, the roads, the hospitals, education, it is through that tax, tax paid by the individual. So as a taxpayer, by remitting it, you are contributing to national development. Uh, three, your business is sort of being advertised. You know, you are VAT registered, you are compliant, and whoever checks, and whoever cross-checks with the URA, with the authorities, we now have been with a credible company. Now we are doing, it's a global economy. International businesses, they deal with a company or a business which is fully registered, tax compliant, and can even be visible in the books of URA of other institutions. So you are advertising your business. Many people, many companies have lost business because of non-compliance of tax is being an issue which is being looked at by many businesses. Mm. So it is very important that you register for VAT and pay. And if you are making sales which are above the threshold and you are not remitting or you are not registering, the offenses were mentioned and the tax investigators will be available and will be on the lookout. And if you don't have it to get into trouble or in any problem with the, the tax authorities, because even what you have said, you think we have saved, it will be recovered because we will penalize it or the amount will be, will be, will be requested, it will be requested to pay all the amount with the interest, with the penalty, and possibly even you may wonder which court you go to, you may get your freedom may be curtailed for some time. So that's another risk you should run as a businessman. The, 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 the highest level of the risk is uh, uh, an extended stay at the institution of higher learning, as some people call it. <laughs> so people should be able to, you know, avoid uh, issues that are on the wrong side of VAT at all mm -hmm. times, but the emphasis should rather be put on uh, the benefits. And like you've said, uh, one of them is authenticity as a business entity. Uh, cash flow, you, you, you're able to manage your cash flow a bit better. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you're getting these advertisements. Now, interestingly, there's uh, a gentleman who has come in via Zoom that is literally in agreement with everything that you've just been talking about. If I can read this particular comment from, uh, from Zoom. Um, it's a comment from a gentleman called Wasa Raymond. First of all, thank you for tuning in and uh, for making this comment. He's saying, URA has made substantial efforts towards making its systems much more efficient. And IFRIS, the one that you talked about, is a good example of that. Despite URA's substantial efforts to the tax mobilization effort, in Waswa's opinion, he's convinced that there is still much more potential that URA could do with IFRIS. Now he's suggesting, my suggestion, or rather his suggestion, would be to create a portal through which taxpayers can access information on the compliant taxpayers, B2B. 
The truth is that while these SMEs are sourcing for uh, suppliers, it's not easy to discern. And some of these SMEs don't have the resources to undertake all procurement procedures. If given a chance later on in the discussion, he can be able to elaborate further on what he means by this. But he's talking about uh, a provision on the portal where people like him are able to know that these are the most compliant taxpayers. Some sort of, 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 of scale, I think, that these are the most compliant taxpayers as per the EFRIS ranking. That way, the, these are singled out and, and, and put... Uh, on, 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 on the face for everyone to, to recognize and know that if I'm looking for suppliers, then perhaps I'm better suited if I'm picking from these guys who have demonstrated uh, exemplary levels. That, that was the suggestion that came through from him. There's, there's also another uh, from, now this one is, this particular question has the name Derek involved in it. And uh, it has been submitted by a Mr. Anonymous. And he's saying, hello, Derek, does the Accountants Act regulate the tax practitioners who are not registered accountants and have never done CPA's program, but have tax e experience and are practicing as tax agents in Uganda? Are all tax practitioners in Uganda required to be governed by the ICPAO Code of Conduct? Very uh, interesting <coughs> question right there. Uh, th thank you, Solomon, and I like the question because... Um, the, the, the person is helping us to highlight the public what it is. Mm -hmm. If the person listened very well, I didn't uh, say state anywhere tax practitioner. Mm -hmm. I said accountant. Mm -hmm. And my role is promote accountancy. But of course, we have seven branches and taxation is one. Um, <coughs> but when we are starting, I mentioned about the state of the country, how it was. And... And, and people try always to, to, to draw parallels, just to make sure they fit somewhere. Mm. But if you want to be <coughs> an accountant, be an accountant. I will tell you that there is a difference between a person who knows about accounting and a person who knows accounting to do your tax affairs. Of course, someone says, I have done, I have worked with URA, I have been dealing with the taxpayers, I know the tax law. Yes, granted, you may. Sometimes they even dangle the years of experience. Yes, uh, but you may have actually one year of experience for 20 years because you have been doing the same thing for 20 years, which means you have actual experience of one year 20 times. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the skill set required to articulate the issues. And that was realized and the, <coughs> the, the Tax Procedures Code Act put together a tax, uh, a tax registrations agents committee. Mm. TAC. Uh, TAC. Uh, where I represent the accountancy profession. But, of course, <coughs> as a country we have to clean up. And people don't want to accept that we are dirty in the way we do certain things and we have to clean up. Um, I have seen that even lawyers, when it comes to some lawyers, when it comes to tax matters, they have come back to accountancy. They are studying accountancy. But, but people don't want to appreciate. After no, qualifying and getting the knowledge of accountancy, they, then they go back and do their tax matters. And people say, no, you don't need to be an accountant to have tax matters. But I can say for a fact that I know you are a the one that had few accountants, and you know the URA that has very good many accountants. The work is different. I know a company that has no accountant, and a company that has an accountant, how it handles tax affairs. So the issue of tax practitioners is debatable, but the, as a country we have a framework, the Tax Agents Association Committee, if one wants to, although in, for me, it would have been independent from URA if it is to become really a professional service. Uh, URA doesn't need to administer that. It should be left so that URA does tax administration purely. But for a start, where it is sitting uh, as Commissioner General being uh, the chairperson of the committee can start. But there is a need to professionalize if really people want to say we are tax practitioners. Mm -hmm. 
there's a need to professionalize that cadership in the country. So the person I'm sure may be a non-accountant who is playing around tax, because I have had that argument so many times, especially for non-accountants who are in URA, because when they get out, they want to be in tax affairs, which at times for me, I think it's a conflict of interest. Um, but, but, but it's a debate. It's a debate that depends on which side you start. In. For me, when I stand on the ethical angle, I don't see a someone who, is, who has no knowledge of accounting to say I'm a good tax practitioner. Because why? You represent income, and how would you determine income to be assessed when you don't know it? As clear as night and day. Yeah. There's another one for you. Yes. Um, Mr. Nkaja, it's close to that one, but it has a slight twitch. And uh, he's saying, this time around he has disclosed his name. This one is Arnold. And Arnold is saying, I would like Mr. Nkaja to clarify. There are many accounting and business degree holders without CPA in the field, but with experience in tax, auditing, and accounting. Are they not supposed to handle any accounting or related services in any firm? The law is very clear. The law says if you are offering accountancy service to the public at a fee, you must be an accountant. If you are in your private affairs, you are in your family business, you studied those processes, it's okay. You are not approaching the public. The law is there to safeguard the public. So if you are there holding out as an accountant to the public, then you should be caught because you are misleading the, account, the, the public. But you can do your affairs. You can be in your private business and do all your things. But do not offer accountancy services to the public at a fee. Also as clear as night and day. Um, <laughs> we have some two more, but these are comments. And uh, they are, they are EFRIS related. We shall field these with uh, the EFRIS team. We are going to have a series of uh, webinars concerning directly EFRIS. But just to uh, a a ensure that the, the people who ask the questions uh, one of them is uh, Mr. Anonymous. Uh, his was about what you are here has in plan to support companies that are struggling with integrating their POSs with the uh, IFRIS. Uh, the IFRIS team will handle that. Then the second one is uh, an issue of uh, on the IFRIS receipts. Can there be a provision for contact details to be added, preferably an email address if phone numbers are really being a problem? This is from Gilbert. And uh, these two will be related to the EFRIS team and they'll certainly um, take care of it. But uh, on just one of these two, uh, Dennis, yes. if, if you could maybe give a quick response to any one of these. Yeah, EFRIS, it is a solution which has been put in place to help even taxpayers to keep their records. Because EFRIS is a system where you can keep your records, record keeping of sales and purchases. And it gives you the net profit and the VAT to be paid. Uh, it also integrates with URA so that we can see what portion of VAT you have created on behalf of, VA, of URA and which should be expected. Uh, integration, we have resist many integrators who are dealing with the taxpayers to help them to go through. But in case you have any issues with EFRIS, we have an office here. We have a team dedicated to support the taxpayers who want to be on EFRIS. We have our toll free lines. We have the call center. We have the WhatsApp number. So you, Facebook, we're on Twitter. We are all in those spaces. So you can contact any and you will be helped. You'll get support to integrate or how to go about it. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis. We've come to the part of the show where we get to mention that one thing that the audience should be leaving this particular show with. It could be a life-changing communication. It could be a quote. It could be a stern warning, <laughs> depending <laughs> on <laughs> which side of the table you're standing, really. Ah. And uh, of course, I'll start with you, Derek. Yeah. What is that one word that you would like to leave uh, the viewers with? Several, but I don't know how I will phrase it. <clears throat> but let the public embrace IFRIS. 
Uh, I think that's when uh, I would start because as a country, we must widen our tax base. So everyone should be happy and feel happy to pay taxes. For me as an employee, I think I'm paying much more tax compared to what others pay because employees, their income is, is, is seen. Uh, but the others seem to be only showing what they want to show. And that's not good for our na national development. So let everyone who does business embrace IFRIS. Let's be ethical. Employ an accountant if you are in need of business understanding. Uh, for me, that will be uh, my, my parting shot for everyone who is watching us and listening to us. Let's work to develop our nation. No one's going to develop our nation. You have all read the stories around investors. And so we need to do whatever it takes to make sure that as Ugandans, we work, we pay taxes to develop uh, our, our country. Thank you so much for uh, those parting shots. For, for, for the benefit of the viewer, embrace efforts if you're in business. The more you're visible, the, the better it is for, for everyone. Um, visibility is a key issue. Be ethical. This was for the practitioners. And the business person. Because VAT is a two-way. I, I remember I described it as a business dishonesty. Yes. That business dishonesty doesn't start with an accountant. It starts with the business person himself or herself. Once the two are ethical, then collusion is a, a non-entity. It's a non-issue. Uh, thank you. Then, uh, of course, employ an accountant is what you said. Yes. For the benefit of Arnold, who asked the question about the graduate, I think for <laughs> emphasis, <laughs> for emphasis, Okay. if you can, just one more time. <laughs> okay. For the public accountancy, employer and accountant. But let me probably paint a picture of the accountancy profession. And I tell you that that's the challenge as a country we, we, we have, that we didn't frame our professionalism very, very well. And even at the time of amending the act in 2013, we explained to parliament, but they still couldn't conceptualize what we are referring to. The accountancy profession is in some form of a pyramid. We have the clerks, we have the assistants, we have the uh, accountants, and then we have the auditors and the, uh, I say, fraud investigators at the top. Um, that's the way the profession should work. But somehow our law is structured starting in the base, starting, sorry, in the middle of the pyramid. So the clerks and the technicians, we are somehow left out. And yet those, I would say, they are the biggest foot soldiers. It's like in a battalion, you have... Uh, a general who you never see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then you have the platoon commander. So, and then you have the foot soldiers. That's how any profession is structured. Irrespective of what people say. Because when, when you go to the doctors, you find they are general doctors, they are specialists, they are, they are consultants, because they have described and trained in a format that helps the, the, the public to be able to respond, uh, no, they are probably, that helps the doctors to be able to respond to the public. So even in us in accountancy, we have that pyramid, which people should try to find. Where do I find an accountant, because an accountant for an entity like URA should not be the same accountant as a, a Kiosik uh, in Nakawa. Um, a, a, an accounts clerk can actually help a Kiosik uh, in Nakawa. And Kiosk in Nakawa can be doing a, a turn of a billion, and someone says, I, 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 don't, I can't afford to pay an accountant. You can, but probably the skill set differs. You need uh, an accountant probably at the base, mm. not an accountant who is at the top. At, at, at the top. At, at, you know, you don't need a, an accounting general. Yes, you don't mm. need an accounting general. For a kiosk. A food soldier for the, for the kiosk. Fair enough. Yes. Mm. Um, Dennis, the chief investigator, this is the moment where you get to give your parting shots to the viewing taxpayers. Um, thank you, Solomon. To our dear taxpayers, we thank you those who are compliant 
and paying their taxes in time and in full. Uh, for us, we are here to facilitate you to make sure you are compliant in case you need any service, any support. Uh, those taxpayers I don't engage in practices which are unethical because it is risky and any time tax investigation will be knocking at your door. It is a matter of when. And when investigations or audit start, you lose a lot because there will be penalties, there will be curtailing of your freedom, you will lose some financial because of interest, financial clout. So don't engage in those practices for a short term gain when you are going to lose in long, long term, term and lose everything almost. Some companies, because of the tax which they have evaded over time, when their ability is shown to them, they can't afford to pay and they lose because they use the quack accountants or those who are prepared to be accountants and they misled them. This business belongs to you, a taxpayer. You put in your effort, your time, your capital, or the oil of your life. So don't accept to be misadvised or ruined by a person who is looking for just a small fee. This business belongs to you, and the tax liability, it will be forwarded to you as a person, as a business owner, and also the penalties, which were mentioned earlier, will also come to you as an individual. So don't take that risky business, that risky path, be compliant, and at the end of that day, you will have a healthy business. Thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, that brings us to the end of uh, this particular episode of the Revenue Pulse. I just want to take this moment to appreciate uh, our distinct uh, panelists who have been able to share on this very issue of VAT fraud. More shows will certainly be coming uh, because this, this is an animal that we, we need to further chew on so that the public really gets to appreciate it eventually. Uh, that it's a problem, it is here, and we are trying to combat it. Um, I take this moment to appreciate the URATV crew that has made this possible. Uh, of course, this particular show has been produced by uh, Saleh Kamba uh, together with Donna. And uh, on set, we have our directors, Omaria and uh, Paul. And we also have our guy, Trevor, on, on camera, making sure that the picture is coming to you smooth and crisp. From all of us at URATV, to you, adios. <laughs>